thankful that we've been able to get into this uh, series that we've been doing for, I think, five or six weeks now. And we've been out of the book of Proverbs, and we've just been taking, I believe, what, what you know, the Scripture teaches us is, is wisdom from God. It's wisdom from heaven. Taking it, receiving it, and applying it to our life. Amen? How many of you know the most important thing is that when we receive the word to ourself, like when the word is sent, it has the ability to accomplish that which it was sent to do. Amen? How many of you know that? But here's the deal. We can't just be hearers of the word. Amen? In the book of James, it, it, it gives us that command. It says, don't be hearers of the word only, but be what? Doers of the word as well. Amen? And so I pray that over the last several weeks, you've received, you know, truth and you've received, you know, wisdom from the Lord and you've received just, you know, things that you can apply to your heart and your life and, and, and you know, help you to navigate life. Because it's important, church, that we understand that in the word of God contains all the answers that you will ever need in this life. Amen. God hasn't left us empty handed. God hasn't left us without a plan. Amen. God hasn't left us to just our own demise to figure things out on our own. The answers uh, of life are in the word. Amen. Because they are of the word. They're of God. Amen. And God is the word. Amen. He's the answer. But I, I want to challenge us tonight to, to really open our hearts and, and, and receive deeper and deeper each and every week. You know, if, if you keep a pot, or if you keep a plant rather in a small pot, it's hindered in its ability to grow. Amen? But if you take that plant out of a small pot, it, it, you know, out of a small pot, and you place it in a bigger pot where its roots could be extended, then it has the ability to grow more and more. Listen, I believe it's important for us as a body of Christ to not be people that are just content saying, you know what, my life's all right. I'm just going to live my life in this little pot. I'm going to live my life in this little tiny way but and have no desire to grow. I believe if we're truly firmly planted in the Lord, growth will happen and growth will continue to happen. Amen? I got a six-year-old tree in my front yard because in November of, of, of 2018, we built a house and they, they planted a tree there and, and, and we were almost there six years. And it was interesting because when I first planted that tree or the builder or whatever, you know, when they first planted that tree in my yard, it was about as thick as my wrist. You know, it was just this little skinny tree and, and it had these ropes on the side of it, you know, because when it gets windy, you know, when the tree's too skinny, it's going to just, it's going to dance, right? Like it could get blown over by the wind. And we had a couple storms like that that were, that were really bad, and, and then you might remember, I think it was in the summer of 2020 when that hurricane passed by pretty close, and, and our trees were going crazy. Well, when that hurricane came, uh, how many of you know what, like, ratchet straps are? You know, those are the straps that you use for, like, tying something to the back of your truck or throwing a deer on the hood of your car, you know, manly stuff like that, right? Am I the only one that does that? All right, so be it. Me and Pastor... We're both guilty. You get those ratchet straps, and I got these ratchet straps, and I hooked them onto this tree because this tree, we, I knew this big storm was coming, and I, and I hooked these ratchet straps on this tree, and I got these metal stakes, and I staked them into the ground, and I tied it around so the tree was, like, super secure. I mean, it was being pulled down to the ground. And that big hurricane came by, and guess what? It still moved the tree a little bit. And me, just because out of caution, I was like, you know what, I'll just leave the straps there. I kind of pounded the stakes into the ground, and I left my tree strapped like that for, I don't know, a good while. So long that one day when I was tired of those straps being tied to the tree, I went to take them off the tree, and the tree had grown around the strap. There was like indentations in the wood, in the branches because the hook that was, you know, kind of holding the branch down at one point, the tree just kept growing. And had I left the straps on there, it would have hindered the growth of the tree. But I cut them off, and shortly after I cut them off, the tree began to flourish again. The reason I'm saying all this, church, is because the enemy would love 
nothing more than you and I to get stagnant in our walk with God. Amen? The enemy would love nothing more for you to just be the same old, same old, just going by the wayside. It's like, you know, you could be in church for 40 years or 50 years or however long you've existed in church, but change not. And listen, I don't know about you, but I'm not a finished product. The Lord is still working on my life. Amen? And when we come to a meeting just like this, this ain't a rebuke. This is just me, you know, being teacher Duke for a minute. When we come to a meeting like this, church, we need to come ready to learn. Amen? Ready to receive. And guess what? Ready to apply it the moment that we walk out of the door. Amen? So as we continue, I want us to open up to James 3 in verse 17. And this is the passage of Scripture that we've been pulling a lot of truth from uh, in, in, as it pertains to what wisdom is. Amen? So James 3.17 says, The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, and then peace-loving. It's considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Amen? So let's pray for tonight's word. Lord, I thank you for each and every person. God, I thank you for every listening ear. Holy Spirit, these people need to hear your voice tonight and not mine, Lord. So, God, I pray that every word of mine falls to the ground, God, and dies, Lord. And I pray that your word, your Holy Spirit, would speak to every heart in this room in the mighty way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said amen. Awesome. You don't want to hear from me, okay? So let's, just, let's just get that straight right away. So, number one, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture, and I want us to highlight in our Bible, or if, if you can underline it or circle it or whatever, but in James 3.17, highlight full of mercy. Full of mercy, because that's going to be the topic of the evening. True wisdom, church, is full of mercy. It is full of mercy. That word means to have feelings of pity, compassion, affection, and kindness. And the deeper definition, the Greek word that was used to describe mercy in James 3.17 is the word elios which means a covenant loyalty, a covenant love, or loyalty to God's covenant. I'll repeat that just a little bit. The word that is describing mercy here is elios, which means a covenant loyalty, covenant love, or loyalty to God's covenant. So there's two things, church, that are essential in order to have mercy. Number one is seeing a need. In order to be compassionate, to have pity, to, to, to you know, be there for somebody, you have to see a need. You have to have your spiritual eyes open to recognize that there is a need present. Amen? Now, sometimes it's easier said than done. We walk past people every single day of our life. You, you, how many of you went to work today? Raise your hand. Amen. You probably walked right past somebody at work that had a great need in their life. But were your eyes of mercy on? Were you able to see that there was something happening in their life or that there was something that they were going through in their life to actually stop from the agenda that you had or the schedule or the plan that you got going on in your life and actually stop just for a moment to look and identify an issue in somebody else's life? Eyes of mercy. Number one is to see a need. And the second thing that's essential in order to have mercy is being able to meet the need. One is identifying it. Two is doing something about it. Compassion does no good unless there's action behind it. How many of you have ever seen the commercials of the, all the long lost dogs and cats, you know, that they want? all of your money to go to, ay, pobrecito, chihuahuito, like, you know, and, and you see the little chihuahua, and he's, like, hungry and tired, and you get compassionate, and then you're just like, ah, change the channel. Like, ah, pobrecito, ah, change the channel. Or even challenging more, you see children that need to be adopted or fed or or, you know, taken care of, and, ah, gee, well, that's too bad, you know, this and that. Ah, change the channel. 
Or you see somebody on a street, you're walking, you know, to store to store, and maybe there's somebody outside on the street and they have a need. Now I'll be the first one to admit that, you know what, I've, I've been fooled by people a time or two. But the Bible says that he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Amen? We'll, we'll read that proverb in a minute. But we have to see the need. We have to be compassionate enough to do something about the need that's present. So Ephesians 2 and 1 gives us a description of God and his mercy for you and I. He said, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 3, all of us, everybody say, me included. <laughs> I think we read these passages sometimes and we think that we're not lumped up into the all. We're in the all, Okay. All of us also lived amongst them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. He said, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. He said, it is by grace that you have been saved. Amen. You see, God saw us, church, dead sinners, those who opposed him, those who were enemies of the cross, those who followed the ways of the world. God knew exactly who you and I were. God knew exactly where we stood in, 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 in comparison of righteousness and holiness to him. And God foresaw and he knew, church, that we were bound to be objects of wrath and of just punishment. I think sometimes we, we, we want to justify ourselves before God. And I have to remind us what the scripture says. The Bible says that our works are even like filthy rags unto the Lord. If we think for a moment that we could ever justify ourselves before a holy and pure and righteous God, then my friend, we've got it completely, completely, completely wrong. We were supposed to be punished in the place of Jesus. Somebody say amen. We deserved the penalty that was placed upon the life of Christ. Your life, my life. But Pastor Duke, I've never been that bad. Your life deserved the punishment that he took. The measuring stick is perfection to which every single person that has ever walked the face of this earth with the exception of Jesus Christ himself could never attain. It could only be bought and paid for through a perfect and holy sacrifice. An atonement made through the spotless blood of the lamb on your and I's behalf. And what I love about the Lord and what this passage is teaching us is it says God, because of his great love for us, is rich in mercy. He offers us something and he extends something towards us, church, that we never deserved. We never could have earned we most definitely shouldn't be in the midst of his grace or his mercy for our life. But because he loved us, church, he saw the need that you had. Amen? He saw the need that I had. And it was his heart to see mankind be restored and brought back into covenant with him. And instead of placing the punishment on your and my life, he chose the one and only qualified to bear the just punishment for the sins of this world, the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. First Peter 1 and 3 says this. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, in his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
See, Mercy Church is compassionate treatment of those in distress, especially when it's within one's power to punish or harm. That's what mercy is. God has the ability, and I think we forget this sometimes. I think maybe you and I, if we're honest with ourselves, we could admit at one time or another, maybe we've abused the grace of God upon our life. Meaning that we go about doing life the way we want to. We go about sinning and, and, and thinking that we're just fine because, you know what, well, his, his grace is sufficient. And his grace will cover me and, and his mercy will always be there. But if we're honest with ourselves, we could admit that at one time or another we may have abused that. And the reason why I bring that into, in, into our mind for us to understand, church, is that when we understand who God is and who we are, and we understand that he has every right, church, that if he wanted to, just like he did in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, God could say, I haven't even found one holy. Poof, he could wipe us all out. He is the only one that has the right to make that decision. He is the only one that could do that. But what I notice about the Lord, church, is this. Is I believe that the Lord loves us far more and desires covenant with us far greater than he does the desire to punish us. Amen? I believe the love of God and the heart of God for you and I, for humanity, for his creation, is that he loves us more than that. He doesn't want to have to punish anyone. He doesn't want the wrath to have to go upon this earth to anyone's life because they lived and choose to live, you know, outside of him. And they choose to not want to receive the gift of mercy and grace that's been extended to us through Jesus. That's why it says in 1 Peter, it talks about the Lord is not slow, as some understand slowness, but he's patient. Amen? He's wanting people to repent. He's wanting people to come back to him. He's wanting people to bow down to him once again. He's wanting people to surrender all and give all back to him. This is truly the heart of God. He's so patient with us, church. He's so mindful. He's so, he's so able to say, you know what, I'll wait another day. And I want us to be mindful of this. Can I remind you tonight that God did not have to love you. Amen? One of the greatest pictures of love that I've received personally in my life was, some of you know my testimony, but my biological father, when my mom, you know, found out that Duke was in her belly, he walked out and he said, I don't want to have anything to do with those kids. Walked out on my mom when she was pregnant with me and, and my older brother was like two. Tough situation. And then a couple years later, my mom remarries. And now I have a stepfather who's not my blood, who doesn't have any, you know, responsibility over my brother and I in a legal sense. But every single day he chose to love us. Every single day he loved us as his own. And to me that is one of the greatest pictures of this kind of merciful love that I'm talking about. The father didn't have to love us. How many of you know that I'm pretty sure none of us in here are, are of Hebrew descent. <laughs> none of us in here are Jews. We're Gentiles. We're the other guys. We're the stepchild. But the Bible says that he doesn't call us that. He's adopted us as his own. Amen. But he didn't have to love he didn't have to bless. He didn't have to restore. He didn't have to bring you into a place of, 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 you know, calling. He didn't have to bring you into a place of purpose. He didn't have to show you compassion or ministry, but he chose to. I heard a guy say this one time. He says, God doesn't need you. He wants you. 
Amen? And it's true. The praises and the worship that we were lifting up, it doesn't sustain God in the heavens. Right? As if he needs our, our sustenance, as if he needs to hold us up and, and boost his ego. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. Amen? And I want a relationship with a father like that, too. And so we see that Christ offered payment for a debt that no one in this world was fit to pay because he loves you. Amen? That is, he chose to lay down his life, and he loved you before you ever loved him. And you were on his heart, and you were on his mind, and you were his concern. Isaiah 63 and verse 9 says this, In all their distress, he too was distressed. It says, and the angel of his presence saved them. It says, in his love and his mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them up, and he carried them all the days of the old. How many of you are thankful for the mercy of the Lord? Amen? I know that I am. And I don't say that lightly, church, but for others who've never received the benevolent love of Jesus, I must remind you of what the book of Proverbs says in Proverbs 28 and 13. See, this is an honest truth here. It says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. See, we may think that we are able to go about life without the Lord and go about life and say, you know what? I don't have to admit nothing. I don't have to confess anything. I'm fine. I can just do things the way that I want to. But here, the scripture gives us truth. It says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces finds mercy. I believe the Lord is a God that is full of mercy, as the scripture says, for everyone as he has been towards you. And he is a father, church, before he is a judge. Sometimes we mistake the nature of who the Lord is. Amen? How many of you have ever had a boss? Raise your hand. (laughs) If you've had a job, you've had a boss, right? And I'm sure the first day on the job, you're probably, you know, super respectful and reverent to your boss, right? It's, oh, yes, Mr. Boss, you know, Mrs. Boss, and, and you're, you know, you're doing everything like a good employee is supposed to do, and you're following all the orders, and you're, you're, you're going about everything like that. And, you know, because you respect them, you know, they hired you, and they can fire you. Right? And then after, after time, you know, once you get to know them a little bit, once you get to go to the company Christmas party with them and hang out and, and you get to know a little bit about their life, you know, maybe the, the boss thing just diminishes a little and now you start just treating them like a buddy or like a friend. And the Lord is the opposite of what I believe we look at earthly authority as. The Lord first desires to be a father to a child greater than he desires to be a judge over a guilty people. We come to him in reverence. We come to him in honor. We come to him in awe. Amen? But we can come to him like a child seeks after a father. I believe the heart of God is to extend mercy over your and my life every single day, church. It was said this by uh, C.S. Lewis. He said, the son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God. Or to put it another way, we had a debt that we couldn't pay, and so Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe. He did it for you, and he did it for me. See, that's what the picture of mercy is. He saw you in your lostness. He saw you in your distress. He saw you in your brokenness. He saw you in your pain. And in all of those things, church, and he did what? He became the answer that you and I needed for our life. For those of us that now live in mercy, and you live in the mercy that God has poured out, for your life, then God's mercy to us is the motivation for showing mercy towards others. The fact that you've received mercy from the Lord should be all the more motivation for you showing mercy towards people around you. Remember, church, that you will never be asked 
to forgive someone else more than God has forgiven you. Amen? And God will never ask you to give more mercy towards others than he's given to you. Proverbs 14 and 21 says, It is a sin to despise one's neighbor. It says, But blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Your Lord God is a God of mercy and of bounty, and what he's challenging us to do is to be a source of mercy and bountifulness to those around us. And that is that if you would be such, you will find salvation for yourself in an everlasting glory. Proverbs 19 and 17 says this, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. I'll read that again. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. It's interesting, church, how the Lord equates our mercy our compassion, our pity, and our generosity towards those who can give us nothing in return as an act received unto himself. Isn't that interesting? Do you remember in the book of Matthew, in the latter chapters, I believe it's 25 or so, and it talks about how the Lord was giving a response to the good and faithful servants, and he Mentions to some, he says, yeah, I was hungry and you fed me. He said, I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and, and, and you saw me. And they're like, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry? When did we ever see you naked? When did we ever see you in prison? Like, and he said, what, what did he say? His response was, when you did it as to the least of these, you did it unto me. And I find that so interesting. I find it so interesting, church, that when we're doing something for someone who can give us nothing in return, the Lord sees it as us doing it to him. How many of you know the Lord doesn't need anything from us? He doesn't need anything from us. See the picture that we're, we're trying to get clearer here tonight? We're starting to understand that, that, that he has no need of us, but he desires us. The same way that I could, I could you know, give to somebody that has no ability to bless me in return, God receives that as unto himself. But this is who we were. We were the pitiful. We were the poor. We were the needy. We were the neglected. We were all of those things. But through the unconditional love of God, he has made us new. Amen? But we need to note a few things about mercy. That is this. Godly wisdom in mercy, church, does not discriminate. I'll say it one more time. Godly wisdom in mercy does not discriminate. That means it knows no discrimination at all. But rather it has pity upon all, both the saint and the sinner. Now, this is important for us to understand. This is really important for us to understand because someone that lives from true wisdom that James 3 is talking about reaches out to help those in need no matter how low or how far they have fallen. The person who lives and shows true wisdom about their life is the one who is moved with compassion and moves so much that they reach out to help every human being who has a problem and a need. I think this is something that's important for you and I to exercise, church. It really is. I think sometimes we look at like outreach and evangelism as just a method to get people in our church when the Lord doesn't look at it that way. Can I be honest with you tonight? If the only reason we do it is to get people in the doors of the church based on a condition instead of into the doors of heaven, then we've got the gospel twisted. Amen. If the only reason you do for others is to be seen by others, then you've got it twisted. 
The Bible clearly says we shouldn't even let our right hand know what our left hand is doing. What's the point? Yes, we can let our light shine before all men like Matthew 5.16 tells us to do. But the premise behind the action is that we would do it for those who can do nothing in return for us. And not do it to be seen, to be noticed, to be, you know, uh, uh, made famous about. I see people all the time, they're like doing stuff for the poor and they've got a camera like this. Hey, look at me. I gave a guy that has no money some money. Do you see the selfish motive behind it? Amen? Should we see that? I hope you see that. I kind of get disgusted when I watch some of that stuff sometimes. Because I realize the impure intention that's actually behind it. Why am I saying all this? The difference between godly mercy and our mercy is that we're selective in whom we choose to show mercy to. (laughs) But God shows mercy to everyone. Amen. We select who we want to show compassion to. Sometimes based on convenience, right? Sometimes based on whoever maybe could see us. We decide if we want to help somebody out. We choose to help only certain individuals because maybe they can do something for us in return. Maybe we can manipulate them by doing for them so that we can get something in return. This is not the way the Lord shows mercy. The Lord would remind us to not be religious, but to only do for those who can do something for us in return. Or that is to only do it in that manner. That's what the religious do. They do it to get something back from you. And the Lord wasn't merciful towards us just because he wanted something back to coerce us. It it didn't have that intention in mind. The purpose was because we needed his mercy far greater than he needs anything else that we could ever do. Amen. The need was solely on our behalf. Luke 6 and 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Matthew 5 and 7, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Amen. I love how quiet you are tonight. Job 29 and 14. He said, I put on righteousness as my clothing. And justice was my robe and my turban. He said, and I was, listen to this. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I took up the case of the stranger. Wow. 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 See, the wisdom of mercy, church, is not selective. It's spirit-led. It's not selective. It's not we just choose it based on the convenience for us, but it's spirit-led. The wisdom of mercy is not judging. It's justifying a cause. Amen. The wisdom of mercy is not merciless, it's merciful. And the Bible speaks to those of us who've learned from it and have meditated on it to do as it says. And the rewards of the merciful is that we ourselves will be shown mercy by God. Famous preacher Charles Spurgeon said this, God's mercy is so great that you may sooner drain the sea of its water or deprive the sun of its light, or make space too narrow, then diminish the great mercy of God. Pastor John Stott said this, if I withhold mercy, then I have lost touch with the gospel. He said, and if I have lost touch with God's undeserved kindness and pardon. What I find so interesting about these two quotes is this, church. Is that if God is so rich in mercy as the Bible describes, and if God is so full of mercy, and if God is so ready 
to show us mercy, then why aren't we merciful towards others? See, that's the real issue at hand. That's what's really hanging in the balance before your and I's relationship with the Lord. Is it the way God has blessed you, the way God has redeemed you, the way God has restored you, the way God has gone out of his way time and again to bring you back into this place of completion and wholeness before him? Why is it, church, that we hang on to things or we're selective with the mercy in which we choose to show towards others. If we could just but for a second think if the Lord dealt with us the way that we deal with others, where would we be? The way that we're not quick to forgive, the way that we're not quick to show mercy, the way that we're selective in who we choose to bless, the way that we're withhold, you know, from others, the way that sometimes we even get manipulative towards others because we want something in return. All those things, all those things, and they happen. They're the realities of life that you and I go through. All of those things. Imagine if the Lord was like, hey, you know what? Uno reverse card. (laughs) And God's like, whew. Okay, now now you get to receive everything that the way you were towards other people. No, 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 that's not what I want, Lord. Isaiah 50 and 4 says this. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. And it says, and he wakens me morning by morning, and he wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. When I was reading through this verse, it it spoke to my heart. This means that anyone who is suffering under the weight of heavy pressure or stress or burden is, is, is like a person that's weary, right? But the wonderful news of the Lord is this, is that there was a Savior that was sent into the world to meet the needs of the broken and the oppressed. Amen? And the Lord God of the universe, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, gave Christ the very words to share with those who were broken, those who were oppressed, and those who were lost. And God taught his servant the words to preach and teach so that he could help and sustain them. Now, I want us to note the the claim of the Savior, God's servant. Every morning of his life, the Bible says, the Lord awakened him and quickened his ear to hear what the Father was speaking. I would say that the same is, is true for you and I. The Lord hasn't awakened you today to just simply abandon you, church. The Lord did not awaken you today, but the Bible says that his mercies are new, what? Every morning. That means that God has has awoken you and I today with with the breath that that he has spoken to our being. But he's wanting to teach us something. He's wanting us to, to know something. He's wanting us to live in such a way that represents his kingdom well. And better than you and I could have ever received, you know, from God. He wants this church to, I believe, re replicate that or reflect that back to this world that is in desperate, desperate, desperate need. And so the Savior then taught the word of God. The Savior did not rebel, listen, against the word of the Lord or against God or turn his ear away from the instructions of the Lord. But everything that the Father taught the Son to say and do, Jesus Christ said and did for the sake of the weary. And I think that's the point that I'm trying to make tonight. Is it everything that you and I have received from the Lord, church, it's not for you and I to just simply receive and contain unto yourself. It's so that you and I, with the mercy, with the love, with the compassion, with the grace, with all the things that God has done for you, you would extend that to somebody else that is in great need. Amen. This will bring you into peace. Amen. This will bring you into right standing with God because when you show mercy towards others, then God is merciful 
towards you. Amen. This brings us that peace that when we're incapable of, of anything, of, of being, you know, financially, emotionally, physically meeting somebody's need. Now, I know that you and I have been in those situations before. There's been times where I've, I've literally been walking past somebody and I, I'm like, dude, I don't have anything to bless them with. But I've gotten real creative and guess what? The Holy Spirit's way more creative than I am. I, I'll share a quick Two quick stories. Amen. All right, we got a few minutes. Two quick stories. You want to know how creative the Holy Spirit is? When he prompts you to do something, he always gives you the understanding. He gives you the grace. He gives you the means, and he gives you the wisdom in that very moment. One of the very first times I, I had an interesting issue, uh, I, I, I encounter rather, with this, with this uh, gentleman there was this gentleman that was passing by our church, and I don't know, I just so happened to be outside, and, and uh, I was out here in the parking lot on this side. Our office is used to, to be over here on the Minnesota side uh, of the church, and, and uh, I was outside for whatever reason, and this gentleman passed by, and he was homeless. He had a shopping cart, and he was pushing some stuff down the road, and, and all of a sudden, we strike up this conversation, and I remember, you know, he asked, you know, started kind of bringing up this conversation about, you know, this particular version of, of the Bible and all this stuff. But point being, he gets to the point where he finally just says, hey, I'm in need. You know, I need a few dollars. And I remember I was, the first thing I thought of was like, I was like, man, you know what? I don't, I don't have anything on me. And, and I didn't. I, I genuinely didn't. And then all of a sudden the Lord's like, yeah, you do. And I'm like, oh, what do I got? You know, so. The Lord, the Lord reminded me that I had this little tube. Anybody, have, have you ever had those, like, uh, what do you call them, those, like, mini M&Ms that come in those little tubes? Yes, amen. Everybody hungry now? Y'all want one? Yeah, go buy me one. All right. So, anyways, there was this little tube of mini M&Ms that I had, and our youth pastor at the time had asked us to put quarters in these little tubes to fill them up for, uh, we are going to give them to, like, missions work. There was this... Uh, thing that we would give to called speed the light. And I remember the Lord just like reminded me, he's like, hey, that tube's in your car. And I think at the time I might have had like, I don't know, eight, nine dollars of quarters that I had just been putting away in that tube. And the Lord told me, he's like, give it to this guy. So I go and, and I, I remember and I go and I run to my car and I, I pull out this tube and this guy just starts weeping and he lets me pray over him and there's some other things that happened, but the point being is that God made a way when I didn't think there was a way. Now, I'm just talking about a simple, benevolent, you know, blessing towards somebody. There was another instance. I was here at Walmart over here on Trenton. This was a few years ago, but I, I, I stopped over there, and I, I think I was getting my car uh, oil changed or something. And so I'm standing there, and I'm, like, in the lobby, and, you know, some time had passed, and I I figured it was about time for me to pay and, and you know, pick up my car because it was ready. So as I'm, I'm standing at the counter, the Holy Spirit starts highlighting this lady to me, uh, the, the lady behind the counter. And, and he, he, he really starts just like, you know, telling me to bless her. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Lord? Like, I don't even know this lady. Like, why am I going to bless her? Why am I going to help her? And next thing I know, me and this lady in this full-on conversation where she's telling me, about her son, and she starts telling me about how, like, she just opened up to me. She tells me that she uh, was left by her husband, like, a few years before, and her husband, what he had done was he had told her to retire, so she had retired from Walmart. She had been working there, like, 20 years, took out her retirement. Apparently, he spent all the money and then left her, and then basically, he was just, like, she was alone with her two kids, and her one son, I think, was just graduating high school and about to go up north to try to find a job and, you know, make ends meet again. And, and she was just struggling. And this lady's telling me all this stuff. And I'm like, I just asked for my oil to be changed. Like, I have no idea why this whole conversation is even happening. And the Lord just tells me to bless her with $100. I don't know her. And, and, and even what she was telling me wasn't the reason why the Holy Spirit was telling me to bless her. And the first thing that I did was I made an excuse. The 
first thing. I go, oh, come on, God. My wife's probably going to get pretty mad at me if I give some stranger lady a you know, $100 bill. <laughs> that was one excuse. <laughs> then I had another one that I was like, I, I just, nah, I can't spend the money right now. I started just, just a million excuses. I said, I don't even have $100 on me. Like, how am I going to give this lady $100? And then I saw this little keychain that was on the rack next to where we were talking. I said, hey, you know, oh, I'll buy that keychain real quick. So I tell the lady I want the keychain, and then you know how you can get cash back. So I got cash back, and I'm standing there, and I'm talking to this woman, and, and I, I take out this $100 bill, and I reach across the counter, and I, I said, here, take this. The Lord told me to give you this. And as soon as I did that, the, the woman broke down in tears. She just began to weep. She was just bawling in the store. And I'm standing across from her, and she's like, no, 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 I can't take it. And, and you know, it's, it's a little conversation back and forth. Finally, it gets to the point to where I said, you know what? Let me pray with you. Walk around the counter, and I, she was ready to receive the Lord, like, so bad. And... Led her through the sinner's prayer, led her to Christ in the middle of Walmart, you know, auto center or whatever they call that thing. And went about my way. And she went about her way. And I stop and think about that oftentimes because I think we're like Peter in the book of Acts. Remember, he walks past the gate of beautiful and and Peter does the same thing that you and I do. He's like, <laughs> silver or gold have I not? You know, like <laughs> he didn't have a means to bless this guy that was begging at the, at the gate of beautiful. But he said, what I do have. He's like, hang on a sec. Silver or gold have I not? He goes, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he goes, Walk. And I think that sometimes, church, that we forget with who is actually living inside of our heart. I think sometimes we just forget a little bit of the power of the Savior, the authority of Jesus that actually reigns and rules in our life. And sometimes, church, we're too quick to just walk past people day in and day out with not having the eyes of mercy on to see that they have a great need, to see that there's something that their life needs, that they need a touch from the hand of God. And God can use you to be the, bring the fulfillment of that. I want to ask you to bow your heads this evening, tonight. The world church is crying out for help and for mercy all of the time. Amen? And Jesus wasn't just someone who could help to help, but he was discerning. And he was understanding of those who desired mercy over forgiveness and punishment. And I believe, church, that some people in this world... Just desire a free pass to heaven without fearing God. But the Lord is always searching for those who would choose to fear him and sin not. And Jesus, he died for everyone. And he died for all. But those who will inherit heaven will be those who display mercy to this world. And I read this and I want to read it to you because I, it ministered to my heart. It said, only at the cross of Christ does man fully see what... It is that separates him from God. It said, but yet it is here alone that he perceives that he is no longer separated from God. It said, nowhere else does the inviolable holiness of God, the impossibility of overlooking the guilt of man stand out more plainly. It says, but nowhere else does the limitless mercy of God, which utterly transcends all human standards, stand out more clearly and plainly. We've been given a cross to carry in this world. Amen. We are to be those that extend the mercy that God has extended towards us to everyone that we come across in this world. Amen.